What's up, people? Super excited that everybody is here today at Second Chance for the people in the room, um, for the people in Tennessee, good old Sweetwater, and for the people watching on the internet all over the world on Facebook, um, lots and lots of comments about where people are watching from. We had somebody, um, again, from South Africa, um, somebody from one of the countries in Europe. I had to go, I had to Google it, but it, I found out it was in Europe. So super glad everybody's here today, and we're continuing our study in the book of Ruth. So if you have a Bible and you want to go to the book of Ruth, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 2 today. Ruth chapter 2. And if you weren't with us last week, you can go to our YouTube channel and Second Chance YouTube channel and catch up on the message. But I'll do a really quick review in just a second. To set up today, I want to talk to you about my personal history with cell phones and um, smartphones specifically, which by the way, have made us dumber because somebody asked me for somebody's phone number the other day and I didn't know it. I will bet you that you don't know 10 people's phone numbers right now. And you and 10 years ago, you did know them, all right? I mean, so smartphones have actually made us dumber. My first smartphone was a BlackBerry. Uh, did anybody have a BlackBerry in here? Anybody have a BlackBerry? Okay, these... Um, Really, really surprising. They still exist. I didn't know this until I was on a plane recently, and a guy sitting next to me had a BlackBerry, and I couldn't stop staring at it. Um, it was like I was looking at a dinosaur, and he caught me looking at him. I was like, I'm sorry. I didn't know these existed anymore. Um, he got a little mad, but I didn't care. We were on a plane. I wasn't going to see him again. Um, but I had a BlackBerry, and this was, it was kind of cool. It had, um, had a game on it, Brick Breaker. Um, I got really good at Brick Breaker, really bad at everything else in my life. But this was my very first smartphone. You could text, you could email, um, you would use it for phone calls. Um, it was, and it was the very first smartphone that I ever had. I quickly moved, though, from the BlackBerry to the Droid. Did anybody have a Droid? This was awesome because it had a keyboard, like a full keyboard and flip it out. It was awesome. Um, and that, this phone right here, everybody raved about it's the droid. You got to get the droid. You got to get the droid. So I got the droid. But once I got the droid, um, some of my friends started getting this thing called an iPhone. And, and then the droid people, they were advertised and they would say, we're better than the iPhone. We're better than the iPhone. We're better than the iPhone. So I got an iPhone because these people advertised for the iPhone. And this was, this was um, when I stepped into the promised land. Now, I know some of you are um, not iPhone users, and that's fine. You'll just be, you'll get into heaven, you'll just be in the back of the line. But, but this is an iPhone, and this is um, the phone that I use. Now, if you're an iPhone user, or you've ever owned an iPhone, this illustration is going to make a lot of sense to you. And if you're not an iPhone user, or you've never used an iPhone, I'm going to try my best to explain it. But if you have an iPhone and you're texting somebody and they don't have an iPhone, it'll, it'll, your text will look, let, let me do that again, your text will look green. So if you text, how are you doing? And they say, great, how are you? That, this right here, the green, means the person that you are communicating with does not have an iPhone. Everybody got that? Everybody got that? But if you do have an iPhone and you're texting with somebody, what color is your text? Blue. Blue, exactly. So let's say that there's a conversation going on between a guy and a girl. And he says, hey, what are you doing? That's an easy first line, guys. Hey, what are you doing? It's very safe. It's very non-assuming. You can, you can use all of what I'm about to share with you, okay? This, this might work or it might not work. And she says... Not much, just sort of sitting around. This could be called a hint. I don't know. Maybe she really is sitting around, or maybe she's dropping a hint. So the guy on the other end goes, really? I figured you would be out somewhere doing something. You see where this is going? You see where this is going? Because he's, he's, he's kind of dropping another hint. And then she comes back with LOL, which means laugh out loud for those who might not know language. If, and, LOL, nope, I hardly ever have plans once I leave work. Now, this right here for the guy is a, is a fish hook. It's like there's the bait, so he's going to go in for the kill, and he says, really? Well, since I don't usually have plans either, why don't we grab dinner on Friday night? And she says... 
If you're an iPhone user, the bubbles. The bubbles means that she's responding, but you don't know what she's going to say. Have you ever texted somebody on an iPhone and you see the bubbles? It's these things right here. It means they're, they're typing something. You don't know if it's good. You don't know if it's bad. You don't know if it's, I would never go out with you. You don't know if it's go jump in the lake. You don't know if it's what time. You have no idea. This indicates that she's saying something. You just don't know what she's going to say. And you say, what does this have to do with Ruth or Jesus or the Bible or God or anything? Today, I'm talking to the people who feels like your relationship with God is in the bubbles. I mean, in the past, you and God, you know, you know how it is. You feel like you, you've heard clearly from God and you've spoken to God and he's spoken to you and everything's going good. But occasionally, we'll go through a season where we're not quite sure what God's saying or what God wants us to do. That's what I call the bubbles. That we know God's at work because Jesus said in John chapter 5 that God's always at work. We just don't know what he's up to. So what do you do? What do you do? when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you're going through a season where the, the bubbles, it seems like this is all you're getting from God? That's what we're going to talk about today as we go to Ruth chapter 2. We're going to start in Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says this. Now, there was, a, there was a wealthy man, wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz. Now, let me pause real quick. This is really important because last week, really quick review, there was a guy named Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, and their sons, Malon and Kilion, which we said meant sick and dying. And they left Bethlehem because there was a famine and they went to Moab and they weren't supposed to go to Moab. It's like 40 miles away. You weren't supposed to go to Moab. You weren't supposed to marry Moabite women. And they left the presence of God. They left the people of God. They went to Moab. They did stuff they weren't supposed to do. Elimelech, Malon, and Kilion all die Naomi comes back, Ruth comes with her, Orpah walks away, and they come back into Bethlehem. So they're back in Bethlehem, and that's where we're going to pick up the story. Um, there's a guy named Boaz, which is a good, strong name. If, you're if you've got a son that, and you're looking for a baby name, Boaz, that's a great name right there. Who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. Now, we're going to discover something about Boaz throughout this story. And it's this, Boaz was strong, but he struggled. Boaz was strong, but he struggled. And there's a myth that goes around life today, and it's especially true in Christianity. And here's the myth, that if you're strong, you don't struggle. In fact, I, I, we'll, we'll just kind of put it like this. The myth is, if you are strong, you will not struggle. Reality is, you only struggle if you're strong. The myth, is, if you are, the myth is, if you are strong, you will not struggle. Reality is, you only struggle if you are strong. Perfect example of this, um, CrossFit. Have any of you ever done CrossFit? Okay, a couple people. My hand is up. I did it one time. I had a friend say, and by the way, he's not a friend anymore. Like literally, I, we, seriously, we're not even friends anymore. Um, but he was like, you need to come do this thing. It would be incredible. And CrossFit people are crazy. Now, I'm not against it. I'm just saying it, it's not my flavor of ice cream, all right? I, I mean, because there, there it's like do 20 push-ups, do 20 sit-ups, put a kettlebell between your teeth, cut 14 flips. I mean, it's, it's insane. But while I don't enjoy CrossFit, I love watching the CrossFit games when they're on television. I love watching the CrossFit. They're all flipping tires. Now, here's the deal. About all the people that compete in, those, in the CrossFit games, they're all strong. You've got to be strong to make it to that level. But they all struggle during the games. They all struggle during the games. They made it to that level because they're strong. So maybe you're struggling, and the struggle isn't an indication of your weakness, Maybe it's an indication of your strength. And some people go, I don't feel that strong. I get it. Maybe it's not our strength that we need to lean in on. Maybe it's God's strength in us that he's trying to teach us how to lean in on. Boaz really does struggle with this. We're going to talk about that a little bit more next week. Uh, verse 2 says this. One day. Now, those two words are huge. 
Because Ruth just came from Moab. She comes back to Bethlehem. Her and Naomi are most likely homeless. They're broke. They're widows. They're destitute. They have nothing. And so one day, the Bible says one day, Ruth the Moabite, isn't it funny how somebody always wants to point out where you came from? I don't know if you ever met anybody like that. It just always wants to talk about what you used to be, but we'll talk more about that later. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out to the harvest fields to pick up some of the, the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me, to, to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. Now, two things stand out in this text to me. One is Ruth and Naomi are in a season of what I call the bubbles. They didn't know what God wanted them to do. They didn't know what God was up to. They didn't know what God expected of them. So you know what Ruth did? She just did the next right thing. When you don't know what to do in your walk with God, just do the next right thing. Now, some people go, I don't know what the next right thing is. It's super complicated. It's not complicated. Jesus, when he was calling his disciples, his primary call was what? Follow me. The reason we think it's complicated is because discipleship material in Christianity are written by people who have been Christians at least 30 years and are super introverted and they can't connect to people that just met Jesus. When it comes to following Jesus, when you feel like you get stuck and you don't know what to do, just do the next right thing. You say, Peter, what does that mean? Ruth went, went to the field to pick some grain. Now, I'm going to show you in just a second and throughout the story, this is one of the most godly, spiritual things she could have done. She didn't get a word from God. She didn't, go, she didn't read her Bible. They didn't even have a Bible back then. She didn't go to a prophet. She just said, you know what? We're homeless. We're destitute somebody's got to do something. I'm just going to do the next right thing. I'm going to go out to the field because the law was if you owned a field and you were harvesting it, you didn't harvest everything. You left some for the poor and Ruth knew about this opportunity and she said, there's an opportunity out there. I'm just going to do the next right thing and seize this opportunity. The second thing I want you to see is she ran this by a person that she knew and she trusted named Naomi. Now, it's the only friend she had. It's the only friend she had. But she knew, because don't miss this, the Bible says Ruth the Moabite. She knew when she went to the field that she was going to be looked down on because of where she came from. She was going to be looked down upon because of who she was. People were going to talk about her. People were going to criticize her. People were going to, what is she doing here? Why is she here? And she, would, she knew that was coming, so she took what she wanted to do to a friend she trusted and said, this is what I'm thinking, what do you think? And bam, the friend says, yes, go for it. And the reason I say that is because there are too many people in the world that are paralyzed by the perception of other people. And we're so paralyzed that we won't step into what we know is the right next step because we know we're going to get criticized. Here's the thing I'm discovering. Life is too short to live for the approval of people that were never going to like you anyway. So, so she, she doesn't let that stop her. Now, now it gets super, super interesting. Watch this. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. And as it happened. Now, that's, that's a comedic line. You don't see it as funny. But once we get through the story, you'll see it as it happened. Like, just, she just happened to show up at this place. As it happened, she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. They keep saying that. That must be important. And it is. We're going to talk about that in two weeks. So she just happened to wind up in the field of Boaz. Now, here's what's funny. Boaz and Ruth meeting literally changes the history of the world. And some people are like, ah, I don't know about that whole history of the world. I promise you it does. In fact, Boaz and Ruth meeting completely changed your life, and you might not even know it. 
if these two don't meet, the world looks completely different, I promise. Some people are like, you're just being over. No, no, I promise you, these two meeting are essential to so much going on right in the world today. But don't miss this. Ruth would not have met Boaz had she not gotten off of her ass. You know what I'm saying? You can just think about that for a little while. In fact, that could be something you look at your neighbor and say, you need to get off your ass right now. You can just go ahead and tell them that. Just go ahead and tell them that. I, I'm not giving you permission to cuss. I'm saying as, A-Z. So if you got offended, you know what? Just log off. I don't care. Anyway, so, <laughs> so Ruth gets off her ass and she goes and meets Boaz. And the Bible says in the next verse, while she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. That, that's, that's unique when your boss walks in and says, the Lord bless you. And everybody says, the Lord bless you. That's how we, got, that's how we roll here at Second Chance when I walk in. This is what we do every week. <laughs> now, the reason they're so excited is because this is the first harvest they've had in 10 years. Remember, they hadn't had har harvest in 10 years, so they're pumped about the harvest, right? Um, the Lord bless you, the harvest replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? Now, long story short, he is checking her out. He, he is noticing her. Now, if you're a couple, think about it. When, when did you, who noticed who first? And you don't have to, this will probably start an argument. But like, who noticed... <laughs> Who first? Well, that, Zach, Carly, who noticed who first? He noticed me. Zach not noticed you? Yeah. Buck and Wanda, who noticed who first? You noticed Wanda? All right, all right so far we got all the guys telling the truth. Um, <laughs> in the story, he notices her, and it's not like, a, oh, she looks, it's like, that girl, that, that girl is fine. <laughs> And you know she had to be hot because she's out in the field, which means she's got on her ratty clothes. She's got her hair put up in a ponytail. She's all pitted out. I mean, I'm, she's not at her best. And he's like, who is that? Now, now watch this. Watch this. Watch what happens. And the foreman said, sir, she is the young woman from Moab. Now, Boaz, Boaz, Boaz. Boaz. I, know, I know she's hot. We've actually talked about that. <laughs> but she's got a reputation. She's a Moabite. You know what, I mean, you know what they do. You know, I mean, you, you know, Boaz, you know about the Moabites. But Boaz is going to show her some grace, and don't miss this. I know some of you hate it when I do this. I'm going to show you next week why it didn't bother him. Wanda, don't shoot me. Wanda, <laughs> Wanda hates me right now. Um, but she don't have her gun today with her, so I'm okay. Um, from Moab, who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She's been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. So they knew, I mean, they were keeping their eyes on her. They, they knew what she was doing. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, now, how's this for a pickup line? Listen, my daughter, not so sure that's the best line you should throw in there, but if she's a little younger, I don't know. It's just, there's, there's definitely an age difference, but in this culture, this was a term of endearment, okay? It wasn't, it was just a term of endearment. He said, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields, because I got my eye on you, okay? Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. In other words, hey, see the, see the girl right there? Hands off. Hand, you got it? Hands off. You keep your hands off her or I will put my hands on you. That's basically what I think he said to these guys. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. This is, this is like a, it's like a pickup line. A little, little bit flirtatious for him, right? But watch her reaction. I love her reaction. It's, it says so much about her character. Ruth fell at his feet. Now, that's very uncommon. If, if you do something nice for somebody today, they don't fall at your feet. But in this culture, it was very common. When somebody showed you an act of kindness, you fell at their feet. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. 
I am only a foreigner. That's huge. I am only a foreigner. That's what she says. I'm only a foreigner. So she identified herself by where she came from, not where she was, which that's a whole nother message for a whole nother time. But notice her attitude because what she could have done is she could have played the entitled card. She could have been like, it's about time somebody recognized what I was doing around here. I came, I was in Moab minding my own business, and here comes Elimelech with his sons sick and dying, and I married one, and one got sick, and, we all, and everybody died, and I came back, and the woman I came back with is bitter, and all she does is cry and complain all the time, so I just had to get out of the house, so I came out of the field, and I'm out here working, and it's about time somebody recognized me. She could have had an entitlement mentality. Do you know anybody with an entitlement mentality? Because I'm, I want to tell you something about entitlement. entitlement. Entitlement leads to bitterness. Always. This person owes me an apology. They owe me an explanation. They owe me appreciation. They owe me. They owe me. They owe me. And as long as we think somebody owes us, we feel entitled. And entitlement always leads to bitterness because nobody ever really does for us what we think they should do for us. However, Ruth was thankful, and thankfulness eradicates entitlement. Um, I've, got a, I've got a really, really good friend who models this um, better than just about anyone I know. And his name's Bob. And uh, I, w- I was having a tough day several months ago, and I just kind of, sh- he said, hey man, if you're ever having a tough day, just let me know, shoot me a text, I'll pray for you. So I Texted Bob, tough day, praying for you. And two minutes later, my phone rings, and it was Bob. And I've got a rule. If Bob calls, you just answer because it's Bob. And um, so I picked up the phone, and he was like, Perry, how are you doing? Like, he's got that loud personality. I was like, well, Bob, actually, my life sucks right now. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of going through this. And he goes, as soon as we get off the phone, text me your address. I'm going to send you a box of balloons and cookies. And by the way, he really did. He sent me balloons and cookies. It was awesome. And... Um, so I, I was just like, you know, kind of, you know, somebody asks you how you're doing. So you kind of feel uh, you know, obligated to ask them how they're doing. So I was like, Bob, how are you doing? He goes, oh, man, I'm just in ICU. I said, intensive, like, who are you visiting? He goes, no, 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 I'm not visiting. I'm here. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, Bob, you're in ICU? He goes, yeah, yeah, I went to Uganda and got malaria and almost died. And they got me in here. But I think I'm going to be okay. Literally, I hung up the phone. I'm like, if I can't be like Jesus, I want to be like Bob. He had the most (laughs) thankful. And watch this. This is something we've got to practice because I've had people go, well, I've got nothing to be thankful for. And I understand getting in that place. So I was working on this and I was walking around my apartment this week and I looked at my couch. I just stopped and I just literally, I paused and I thanked God for my couch. God, I've got a couch. Now, some people don't think to thank God for their couch, but listen, I can remember the summer of 1988 when my furniture got repossessed. My dad got arrested for selling drugs, got put in jail, and we, they came and repossessed our furniture. And so I can remember what it's like to have your couch taken out of your house. And so when you can remember something like that, and I can look at my, my couch that's paid for right now, by the way. I don't rent couches anymore. Um, it's paid for. That's just something, that's just one of those exercises you can do. That's an exercise in in thankfulness. And that's what Ruth showed. She she said, now, remember what she said. She said, I'm only, like, why are you so kind of me? I'm only a foreigner. I love what Boaz says. Yes, I know. Boaz said, I know know where you came from. I know what's going on in your life. Why does he show her this much grace? Tell you next week. Yes, I know, Boaz replied. But I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have, learned, I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Boaz goes, I know what you did, but I know what you're doing. And what you're doing, like it overshadows what you did. I mean, this is, this is un, unbelievable grace. I hope I continue to please you, sir, she replied. 
you have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I'm not one of your workers. So a little bit of, this is what you call the initial conversation between the couple, okay? They're, they'll eventually become a couple. I'll tell you that much right now. They'll, they'll eventually become a couple. So the Bible goes on to say this. At mealtime, Boaz called to her. So this is their first date. Come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. I, I guess that was a pickup line. I don't know. I don't, Hebrew pickup line. So she sat with his harvesters, and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all she wanted and still had some left over. So you see, Boaz's heart is kind towards her. She is thankful for the kindness that she's receiving from Boaz. Everything is going good so far. And then the Bible says, when Ruth went back to work again, pause. She just kept doing the next right thing. She didn't say, well, I came to this field. Somebody recognized me. I'm going to sit here and just get recognized for the rest of my life. She was willing to do the next right thing, and she kept doing the next right thing. I'm going to keep working until God shows me what's next. Until God clearly speaks to me, I'm just going to keep doing the next right thing. So, so she went back to work again, and Boaz ordered his young men. So he's kind of taking care of her on their side. Watch this. Let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her and pull some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. So he is watching out for her. He's caring for her. He's got compassion for her. He thinks she's hot. Like all this stuff is going on at the same time. Bible goes on to say, so Ruth gathered barley there all day. And when she beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. She carried it back in town and showed it to her mother-in-law, Ruth. Um, mother-in-law, Ruth, also gave her the roasted grain that was left over from her meal. Now watch what, Ruth said, or watch what um, Naomi says. Where did you gather all this grain today, Naomi asked? Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. Pause. Ruth was carrying so much blessing back with her that Naomi said, there's no way you accomplish that on your own. Somebody had to have helped you. And what we see, the principle we see at work here is the principle we see in life. If we're ever going to accomplish anything significant, we're never going to do it on our own. It's not just going to be you, but who surrounds you that helps you accomplish. what. That's, this is why I believe with all my heart that we cannot do life alone, that we have to have community. We have to have people who will rally around each other in, times of, in good times and in bad times when we need grace and when we need truth and speak into each other and help each other accomplish more than we could have ever accomplished on our own. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about our church because I think that more and more people will come in, they'll get connected, and eventually they'll accomplish more together than they ever would have done apart. So that's, that's just a principle in this text. And so Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. She said, the man I worked with today is named Boaz. It's just an awesome name. May the Lord bless him, Naomi told her daughter-in-law. He is showing his kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. Then Ruth said, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back, stay with his harvesters until the entire harvest is complete. In other words, we had a date, it went good, and he wants me to keep coming back. He didn't ask me on another date, but he did ask me to come back around. Good, Naomi exclaimed. Do as he said, because she got some food out of this deal too, right? Do as he said, my daughter, stay with his young women right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but you'll be safe with him. So Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's fields and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest in early summer. And all the while, she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, Initially, Boaz notices her. They meet. They have a lunch together. There's kind of a romantic thing going on there. And then for like six to eight weeks, Boaz don't call. 
Boaz don't talk to her again. There's, there's no interaction. I don't know if you're a girl and you've ever experienced this. We went out, he won't call me again. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Do I text him? Do I like his Instagram post? I don't know, what do I do? You do nothing. You just let him see, you let him take, you let him notice you again. That's what's going on. Can you imagine how frustrated this might have been? She was like, well, this guy, and he shows me interest in me, and we had food, and I got to dip my bread in the wine and all that other stuff, and I went back working. Now, now I, don't, I don't even know what's going on. It was the bubbles. And all she knew how to do was the next right thing. So let me ask you this question. What's the next right thing for you? And don't make it too complicated. Let me tell you, let me, let, me, let me share a great example of what this looks like for my own life. Two years ago, July, or July 10th, 2016, was one of, hands down, the worst days of my life. It's when I got fired um, from my former church, and it became public, and lots of stuff went out on the internet that day. <laughs> Most of it not true from people that didn't even know me. It, talk about a just day. If you could go back in history and erase that day, that's one of the days, one of the top three that I would erase. It was awful. So July 11th, I woke up. And what do you do? What do you do when you've lost everything? You've lost your family. You've lost most of your friends. You've lost your job. You've lost your career. What do you do? I had no plans. You don't plan for something like that. So all I did was got out of bed, walked in the kitchen, made a cup of coffee, and read my Bible. That's all I knew how to do. Reading my Bible on that day was the next right thing. I couldn't even really pray that well. I couldn't articulate what I wanted to articulate to God, but I, he, he kind of knows what we're thinking anyway, so I wasn't that worried about it. But for me, on that day, reading my Bible was the next right thing. I didn't say, well, I'm going to start a church. It's going to be called Second Chance Church. I'm going to have this thing. It's going to be called The Growth Company. I'm going to do it. I had, I had no idea. And you know what I did on July 12th? The next right thing. I, I would just get, I got up and I just read my Bible. Now, I say read my Bible because that's how I really feel that God communicates to me is through the word. And, and, and for me, that was the next right thing. And it's what got me through that season and still keeps me going today. When I'm in a season of those bubbles, I just do the next right thing. And so my question for everybody today is what is the next right thing for you? What's the next right thing? Now, once again, this is, not, this is where I'm not, and I'm so tempted to because I love, love, love being super, super practical, but I'm not going to give you recommendations on what the next right thing could be, and here's why. Because you know. The next right thing for your life. What is the next right thing? Thing. And if you don't know, it's a great opportunity to ask God who wants us to get it right more than we want to get it right. So with that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this incredible story in your word. And God, how you have clearly shown us in your word that you are always at work and you always want what's best for us. And Father, I pray for those here today who may feel stuck in the bubbles, stuck in a season of a doubt and uncertainty and just don't know what to do. Father, that right now you would give them, you'd give us the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to follow through. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus but if, if you don't know what the next right thing is, just ask him right now. God, show me the next right thing. And maybe for some today, the next right thing is actually accepting Christ into your life. You've heard about Jesus. You've heard about accepting Jesus, but you've never actually received Jesus. And 
if that's you and you know that's your next step, like you, you know right now, you know that's your next step is to receive Christ, then I want to invite you to pray to receive him right where you are, whether you're in a car, whether you're in, um, at Life Spring in Tennessee, no matter where you are, just to right now, accept Christ into your life. You can do this by just praying in your heart right where you sit and you can say, Jesus Christ, I confess you are Lord. Come into my life and take over. I surrender complete control to you. I believe you died on the cross. And you rose from the grave to pay for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now, if you just prayed that prayer and you're at Life Spring in Tennessee, if you'll just hold your hand up and you'll just hold it up real high so we can celebrate there at Life Spring with you. We want to celebrate with you and um, somebody's going to come tell you what your next step is. If you just pray to receive Christ online, you can hit the hand raise emoji on the Second Chance website, or you can put your hand up on Facebook. You can hit the little hand emoji just so we'll know um, that you've accepted Christ because we want to celebrate with you and do anything we can to help, help you do the next right thing because all of us have a next right thing. Father, thank you so much for all that you have done, for all that you're going to do, and we love you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now, don't tune out because I got a very, very important building update. Lots and lots of people have been asking about the building. Lots of people have been asking about what's the building look like and how's that coming along. Um, if you haven't seen the pictures, they look really cool. This is um, the construction sign. Trail is doing the construction Second Chance Church. It's on Clipson Boulevard. It's um, right in front of Target and Lowe's. Um, people have asked me for the address. I don't know what the address is. It's in the shopping center that's in front of Target and Lowe's. There's a picture of it. You can like do a screenshot. That's where it is. All right. It's right next to Fuji, Barberitos, and Rio Body Wax. So you can get some Mexican food, get wax, come to church at the same time. It'll be great. All right. We've got a couple pictures of, um, this is what the inside looks like. Um, we're kind of doing some demolition. We're going to tear up that carpet. We're going to do some stuff, different things to the walls. Um, this right here is the part of the children's area um, that's kind of being remodeled. We had to remove some stuff, take some stuff out. We're kind of putting some stuff in. And then we got this going on. This is kind of like um, all of this is gone, but this is kind of the demolition that's taking place. And we're super, super, super excited. But I wanted to share, because people have been asking, I want to share today, when is opening Sunday at Second Chance Church? When are we going to be able to get in this building? Now, up until earlier this week, opening date was September 30th of, of this year. So September 30th, and we picked that date strategically because Clemson has a home game with Syracuse, and so we're going to beat them on Saturday, and we can celebrate that victory and Jesus on Sunday. But um, just, to, and I just want to let you know, we have uh, put the opening of the building on hold indefinitely. And, and here's why, and I'll tell you the whole story, and this is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because of the incredible giving at Second Chance Church, because of the way people have given, we've been able to do some really cool stuff. We're support, we, uh, we, we've supported missions from day one, and so we've got some mission support going out. We've been able to lease office space, so this space right here where we broadcast from, we've been able to lease that. We've been able to secure this building, um, put the security deposit down, and pay a few months' rent in advance so they would know that it's cool to work with the church. We were able to put down the deposits on um, the utilities to be put in our name. And my God, if I were starting a business tomorrow, I'd put, I'd start a utility company and just charge people deposit money. Y'all are robbing people. You should feel bad if you work for a <laughs> utility company. Um, so we were able to put down the deposits for this. Um, and we were able to sign a contract with the construction people and we have all the money to pay for all the construction. Um, but we also started a, a campaign called the 250K campaign, the $250,000 campaign. And the reason we called it $250,000 is because that's what we needed to raise in order to finish the project. Well, so far out of the 250K campaign, we've raised about $25,000. So we're going to delay the opening of the building until we can raise about $225,000. And that's not, that's not, um, that's just, we don't have the money in the bank to complete the project. When I say complete the project, you say, well, if we can complete the construction, what else do we need? Well, we need things like chairs for people to sit in. 
Um, we need uh, nursery equipment, um, cribs. And, and I want to pause. Do not contact us about donating a crib or anything because I've worked in church world for a long time. Have you seen some of the stuff people try to donate to the church? It's like 75 years old in the basement and it's got bed bugs in it. And we're not, I'm, listen, we're not sending kids home with like third degree bed bug bites, all right? So <laughs> we're going to buy brand new, nice, safe equipment. Um, we, we've got to get, we, we don't even own a microphone. Um, we got to get a sound system. There's so much that we've got to do and we've got to raise $225,000 to do it. Now, there's a couple options. If people keep giving at the current level, we'll be able to cash flow the entire thing by December or January what is what it looks like by December or January. So, and listen, We'll continue to broadcast and do church online until then. I'm so cool with this because so far, just through this, just through this right here, we've seen 205 people come to Christ since we started Second Chance Church just through an online venue. So I'm completely awesome with it. But if we want to get in there sooner, all it takes is money. That's all it takes. And so I'm asking you if you really, really, really want to make us happen. Because some people look at $225,000 and they go, oh my God, there's, I don't have that much money. I don't either. I know exactly how that feels, right? But this is how it breaks down. If we had 500 people give 25 bucks, 250 people give 250 bucks, 50 people give 2,500 bucks, one person give $25,000, we're there. And by the way, if you can give more than $25,000, don't let me limit you, all right? Please feel free to, to do it. Um, but that's what it'll take. And, 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 and the, reason, the reason I'm saying we're delaying is because for this first phase, I don't want to borrow any money. I've had a lot of people online going, we're super excited, we're super excited, we're super excited. If you're super excited, find yourself on that chart and jump in. Find yourself because we're going to make this happen, but I want to make sure it happens by people who don't just say they're excited, but show they're excited. And so just, listen, anybody can give 25, but you, we spent that at Starbucks last week. Okay? Um, it, just find yourself on this chart and get involved. You can give two ways, all right? You can go to mysecondchancechurch.com, mysecondchancechurch.com. You say, Perry, why did you call it mysecondchancechurch.com? Secondchancechurch.com was already taken, and I've always thought, you know, we should always be proud of our church. I love my church. Second Chance is my church. Therefore, it's mysecondchancechurch.com because we all know we need a second chance. In fact, most of us blew our second chance 40 years ago. We need a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one or whatever. So, but... That's the website. You can go to the Second Chance Church Shop website and give there, or you can mail a check for those of you that still actually do things like this. And I do, by the way. You, this is our address. You can screenshot this right here. Put 250K fund in the memo or um, the Perry Noble Jeep fund. That's another fund that I hope to start one day. That's a joke. <laughs> Probably not a big joke. But you can, you can send a check to this address right here. And, and at the end of the day, this is what I believe. The best is yet to come. We're going to get in that building in God's time. And that's what I know. It's in God's time. I had a plan for September 30th, but you know what? God's plans are higher than my plans and his ways are higher than my ways. And so when we get in that building, we will sing and we will celebrate and we will say that God is good. But until we get in that building, we will continue to sing and we'll continue to celebrate and we'll continue to say that God is good. Because no matter where we are having church, whether it's in a living room or whether it's in a facility, we're going to see people meet Jesus, and we're going to see lives changed. And at the end of the day, God will get the glory for it all. So when I say the best is yet to come, I believe it with all my heart. Love you guys, and we'll see you next week for part three of Ruth.